Hello medicos, good day to all of you. So this is Dr. BK for you with an interesting topic on the thorax that is the pericardium. Okay. So in the last few classes we have discussed about the thoracic wall, then we have discussed about the pleural cavities. So there is the lung and the pleura which is covering the lungs. Then we have discussed about the boundaries and contents of the mediastinum. Now you all know that the heart with its pericardium is present inside the, the heart with the pericardium is actually present in the middle mediastinum. Okay. So this pericardium which surrounds the heart and protects the heart to some extent. So our learning objectives for today will be mainly we will try to understand what is the pericardium, some general aspects about the pericardium followed by that. So what are the various components? or the subdivisions of the pericardium, relations of the pericardium, how actually it is disposed around the heart. Then we will discuss about the pericardial sinuses, okay? the various pericardial sinuses which is present and briefly we will also just discuss about how the pericardium develops or how it actually surrounds the heart and how the sinuses are also developed in the fetal life. And finally, we will actually touch upon some applied aspects. Okay. So time and again, I have been telling that the various silomic cavities which are actually present, the pleural cavity, your peritoneal cavity. Same way today we are going to discuss about the pericardial cavity. Okay. Now the pericardial cavity is slightly different from the pleural cavity which we have discussed about the pleura. Okay. It is more or less the same but there are slight differences to it. Now, first of all, unlike pleura, this is a fibrocerous sac. Okay? It has got a fibrous covering as well as a serous sac. It has a fibrous sac and a serous sac both actually enveloping the heart. Whereas, in case of the pleura, what happens is it is only the serous sac. Then, if you look at the pericardium, it is actually conical in shape, but it is not a full cone because the upper end or the apex of the cone is actually truncated. It is cut or that means the upper end of the cone is blunt. So, it is not a perfect cone. It is conical in shape with its apex truncated and as I told you it is situated in the middle mediastinum. Now anteriorly it is situated behind the sternum not only on the sternum but also on the parasternum extending vertically from the second to sixth costal cartilage. It extends from the sixth to second to sixth costal cartilage anteriorly. So it is retrosternal. Posteriorly, the extent, the vertical extent is going to be from fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth thoracic vertebra. Okay. So it extends from the fifth thoracic to the eighth thoracic vertebra. That is the vertical extent. And mainly it contains the heart and the great vessels that is the beginning or the ending 
द फॉर्मेशन और ऑरिजिन ऑफ द ग्रेट वेसल्स ऑफ द हार्ट और the vessels which are coming at terminating so term termination of the certain vessels or the beginning of certain vessels from the heart so mainly beginning is going to be your arteries or the outflow part of the heart and termination is going to be the veins or the inflow part of the heart so here you are able to see a lateral view of the mediastinum in the front it is related to the sternum and second to sixth costal cartilage behind it is related to the fifth sixth seventh and eighth thoracic vertebra with the intervening intervertebral discs so the pericardium encloses not only the heart but also the major vessels which enter and leave the heart now the pericardium as i told you it is a fibro serous sac which means it has got a fibrous covering which is called as the fibrous pericardial sac fibrous pericardium an outer sac then inner it is lined by the serous sac so this serous sac the properties are more or less the same as your pleura okay the properties are more or same like the pleura so the heart is actually present inside the fibrous pericardium and it is a open sac because above it is truncated or it is pierced by these great vessels which are entering and leaving the heart so heart lies within the fibrous pericardium and above it is open so it is a open sac whereas the serous pericardium is actually a closed sac okay the serous pericardium is not pierced by any structures it is a closed sac and the heart actually lies outside the serous sac which means it is surrounded by this serous sac anteriorly inferiorly posteriorly and to the sides but it is not present within the two layers that means your serous pericardium which is made up of the two layers in between these two layers of the serous sac you have only the pericardial fluid okay so it is actually outside the serous sac Okay. so as i told you outer fibrous sac and inner serous sac so this serous sac has got a parietal layer and the visceral layer same as that of the pleura which has got a parietal pleura and the visceral pleura same as that you have the outer parietal layer of serous pericardium and inner visceral layer of the serous pericardium so both the layers as i told you it lines the heart or surrounds the heart but heart does not pierce or does not enter between these two layers so it lines the heart and within these two layers the pericardial fluid is present so the pericardial fluid is present between the two layers of the serous pericardium so the two layers being the parietal layer and the visceral layer of the serous pericardium okay so the heart is outside the serous pericardium which i have <coughs> explained to you why so so same like your lung how actually it invaginates into the pleural cavity in the same way you can see how actually the heart invaginates into the pericardial cavity so here you are able to see the anterior part of the pericardium is removed that is the fibrous pericardium is removed so that is the cut edge of the fibrous pericardium you have the two layers of the serous pericardium deep to the fibrous pericardium and in between the two layers this space is actually the 
pericardial cavity which is filled with the pericardial fluid pericardial cavity filled with the pericardial fluid the heart so you can imagine the fist of your hand as the heart which is actually innervate imaginating into this sac the serous sac especially from behind okay from behind what happens is it invaginates and that by reducing this cavity into a potential space this large sac like structure will be reduced to a thin space as the heart completely comes and occupies it pushes these two layers so thereby these two layers are approximated with only a thin space between them filled with thin layer of pericardial fluid okay so with this general introduction about the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium so fibrous pericardium heart lies within the fibrous pericardium and it is a open sac now we will try to see in detail about this fibrous pericardium so it is conical in shape and as i told you it is truncated above or at the apex because it is pierced by the the great vessels which are entering and leaving the heart so fibrous the name itself implies it is a thick covering made up of collagen fibers so it is a thick and a tough coat mainly it holds the heart in its place and also prevents the over distension of the heart okay so it prevents the over distension of the heart to some extent because there are also other factors which are coming into play to prevent the over distension of the chambers okay so since it is a bit tough it gives resistance to some extent so that it does not allow the over distension or over expansion of the heart so if you trace the fibrous pericardium above it blends with the outermost covering of these great vessels that is your tunica adventitia any blood vessel has got tunica adventitia the outer fibrous coat same way here also it actually blends okay your heart itself can be compared to a blood vessel with the three layers like tunica intima you have endocardium like tunica media you have myocardium and the tunica adventitia only here we are discussing in the form of the pericardium okay but only thing it shows some modifications and it is also showing some internal subdivisions okay so it blends here with the adventitial coat of the great vessels especially the outflow tract the pulmonary trunk and the aorta and above it extends to the pretracheal fascia in the neck Okay, and you all know that trachea from the neck it goes down into the thorax up to the fourth thoracic vertebra. So in front of the trachea, what you have is the pretracheal fascia, which is a modification of the deep cervical fascia, modification of the deep fascia of the neck. So it blends with the pretracheal fascia above. Below, if you look at the fibrous pericardium, it is. very much adhered to the central tendon of the diaphragm the central part of the diaphragm is actually tendinous and the fibrous pericardium is actually very much fixed to the central tendon of the diaphragm why so because the fibrous pericardium and the central tendon of the diaphragm has the same common source of development so it is developed from a single structure which is your septum transversum so septum transversum gives rise to the central tendon of the diaphragm as well as the fibrous pericardium so that is why both are actually very firmly attached and inseparable 
in front the fibrous pericardium is attached to the sternum by the sternopericardial ligaments you have the superior and inferior sternopericardial ligaments so the sternopericardial ligaments we have already discussed that in the anterior mediastinum which does not have any important structures okay uh, when actually <coughs> with respect to the anterior mediastinum so here just take a section of the heart and you are able to see the thick fibrous coat is the fibrous pericardium then you have the serous pericardium disposed into two layers the parietal layer is very much adhered to the interior aspect of the fibrous pericardium the visceral layer is actually attached to the heart in between these two layers what you see is the pericardial space or the pericardial cavity now between the <coughs> myocardium and the visceral layer there is again a subserous space okay the subserous space which is filled with fat variable amount of fat is present and actually the blood vessels of the heart are actually present in this layer okay there is a subserous layer which is present deep to the visceral layer intervening between the visceral layer of serous pericardium and the myocardium now relations of the fibrous pericardium so superiorly we have seen it blends with the great vessels inferiorly adhered to the central tendon of the diaphragm anteriorly if you look it is related to the anterior thoracic wall especially the second to sixth costal cartilage the intervening intercostal spaces intervening intercostal spaces but all these this rib that is your thoracic cage your ribs and the intercostal spaces are separated from the fibrous pericardium by the lung and the pleura so this anterior margin of the lung and the pleura intervenes between your fibrous pericardium and your thoracic wall but at one place where the left flank deviates between the fourth to sixth costal cartilage okay on the left side between the fourth to sixth costal cartilage where the lung deviates forming the cardiac notch there the fibrous pericardium is in direct contact with the sternum and the anterior thoracic wall the only structure separating this pericardium from the thoracic wall is the endothoracic fascia it is the endothoracic fascia now this area between the fourth and sixth costal cartilage where the lung and the pleura deviates and this is actually called as the area of cardiac dullness okay it is actually called as the area of cardiac dullness so anteriorly it is related to the anterior thoracic wall as i told you and there is the area of cardiac dullness posteriorly the fibrous pericardium is actually related to mainly the structures of the posterior media stinum okay so the anterior boundary of the posterior media stinum itself is formed by the posterior surface of the fibrous pericardium posterior sloping surface of the diaphragm and the bifurcation of the trachea so the fibrous pericardium will be related to the trachea especially the bifurcation of the trachea descending thoracic aorta esophagus azygos vein hemi azygos vein and thoracic duct okay so that is the posterior relations on either side the fibrous pericardium we are able to see this fibrous pericardium on either side is related to the mediastinal surface especially the cardiac impression of the right lung and the left lung with the pleura covering it that is the mediastinal pleura okay on either side is covered by the lung and the mediastinal pleura intervening between the pericardium and the pleura is the phrenic nerve and the pericardiophrenic vessels
So on each side, lung and the mediastinal pleura. Between the pleura and the pericardium, you have the phrenic nerve and the pericardiophrenic vessels. So these are the relations of the fibrous pericardium. Below, we have the diaphragm. As I told you, it's it is the central tunnel of diaphragm and related to the left lobe of liver and the fundus of the stomach. So these both structures are actually present immediately below the diaphragm. So the fundus of the stomach and the left lobe of liver are separated from the fibrous pericardium by the central tendon of the diaphragm. Now what are the structures which pierce the fibrous pericardium? As I told you the fibrous pericardium is a open sac. Above it is truncated or it is pierced mainly by the pulmonary trunk and the ascending iota. Okay, mainly it is pierced by the pulmonary trunk and the ascending iota. Not only that, it is also pierced by the superior vena cava at the level of second costal cartilage. The superior vena cava pierces the fibrous pericardium. Then it will be pierced mainly by the apart from the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava and the four pulmonary veins. Okay. So ascending iota, pulmonary trunk dividing into right and left pulmonary arteries, four pulmonary veins, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. These are the structures which pierce the fibrous pericardium. So far we have seen the relations, the extent of the fibrous pericardium and we have also seen the structures piercing the fibrous pericardium. Now we will pass on to the serous pericardium. Serous pericardium, so it is a serous cavity which secretes serous fluid, a large pericardial cavity. The heart actually invaginates into the pericardial cavity from behind and reduces this large cavity into a potential space. So now this large cavity, because of the invagination of the heart, it pushes or obliterates the cavity, is reduced and thereby finally it is in the form of two layers. The outer layer is the parietal layer and the inner layer is the visceral layer. Okay. So for the sake of understanding, it is purely a diagrammatic representation as if the whole heart comes and enters into the pericardium, but actually it is not so. So we will see after a couple of slides actually how the heart enters into the pericardium. So, Basically, this serous pericardium is present within the fibrous pericardium and it is a closed sac. Here you are able to see any end you go, you will go within the serous sac. It is not open so that you cannot go outside or the pericardial fluid does not come outside. So it is a closed sac and it lines the heart anteriorly, posteriorly, inferiorly and at the sides. It is purely a serous sac whereas the fibrous pericardium is a fibrous sac. So it is more or less like your <coughs> pleural sac which is also a serous sac. So as I told you it is initially a large sac and reduced to potential space obliterated by the heart from the behind which enters into this space. Now this space contains a thin layer of fluid which is the pericardial fluid. Now, why actually this fluid is present to allow free movement of the heart? Because heart beats. So, if there is a fluid medium around it, thereby it can freely pulsate. Are you able to understand? So, it can freely pump during the diastole and the systole. And to some extent, it also acts as a shock absorber. Okay. It prevents any blow to the chest wall 
is actually what happens is any blow to the chest wall the effect transmitted to the heart is protected to some extent by this serous pericardium now so this serous pericardium has two layers one is actually the parietal layer which lines the inner part of your fibrous pericardium so interior of the fibrous pericardium if you look at the inner aspect of the fibrous pericardium it is somewhat smooth and shiny because it is actually lined by the parietal layer of the serous pericardium the other layer which is intimately related to the heart is the visceral layer okay so the parietal layer lines the interior of your fibrous pericardium whereas the <coughs> visceral layer actually lines the heart and the great vessels attached to it so as i told you it is separated from the myocardium by the subserous fat and areolar tissue and the vessels that is the arteries coronary arteries and the veins of the heart are actually seen in this subserous layer if you look carefully the serous pericardium the two layers parietal layer reflects on to the visceral layer here also parietal layer reflects on to the visceral layer or you can tell vice versa visceral layer reflecting on to the parietal layer if you see this reflection lines of reflection it is in the form of two tubes okay so how actually it is in the form of two tubes we will try to understand it so here you are able to see around the outflow tract one tube lines or reflection the reflection of the parietal layer around the visceral layer or vice versa what tube is around the outflow tract that is your pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta the other tube again reflection of the parietal layer with the visceral layer which are shown in two different colors is again around the inflow tract so inflow tract is mainly all the veins your superior vena cava your inferior vena cava and the pulmonary veins which are entering the heart so there is one reflection around the outflow tract and one reflection actually around the inflow tract so one tube surrounds the aorta and the pulmonary trunk other one svc ivc and the pulmonary veins if you carefully examine the reflection around the venous end inflow tract it is in the form of inverted j shape okay so the reflection from the visceral layer to the parietal layer is in the form of inverted j shape especially around the venous end okay so this is to just show a diagrammatic representation of how anteriorly around the outflow tract and posteriorly around the inflow tract so that is the venous end of the heart tube so how actually the pericardium develops to know that first we should try to understand little bit about the development of the heart you see these are two endocardial tubes these tubes what happens is they approximate each other and they fuse apart from their fusion they also show some dilatations and now this is actually called as the primitive heart tube so the parts of the primitive heart tube are from above downwards bulbus cordis and more above that you have the truncus arteriosus truncus arteriosus is going to form the great vessels root of the great vessels bulbus cordis is your outflow tract of the ventricles then this is the primitive ventricle which is going to form the chambers then what happens is you see the primitive atrium and finally you see the sinus venosus 
which is going to form the inflow tract okay so bulbous cord is primitive ventricle primitive atrium and sinus venosus now this heart tube primitive heart tube is going to undergo a looping or folding which is actually called as the formation of the cardiac loop okay which is going to form the cardiac loop and this cardiac loop will invaginate into the pericardial cavity so parts of the heart tube are bulbous cord is primitive ventricle primitive atrium and the sinus venosus okay now <coughs> if you are able to see originally see where the heart and the pericardial cavity is present it is somewhat present cranially in front of your head anterior to the in the head region you are able to see this okay so originally they are formed here these are all these cell clusters and your genic cell clusters they are going to coalesce fuse to one another and basically they will form the two heart tubes now as the brain vesicles are enlarging so it has to accommodate the enlarging brain vesicles so it cannot go on extending further beyond so a fold occurs at the cranial end which is called as the head fold same way at the caudal end also the tail fold is going to occur when the head fold occurs the heart with its pericardial cavity once which was present cranial slowly moves caudally and comes to lie in its spinal position okay comes to lie in the spinal position now the pericardial cavity which was posterior due to the head fold what happens it comes to lie anterior to the heart tube okay so or vice versa you can tell the heart comes to lie dorsal to the pericardium originally it was present cranial to the foregut and to the septum transversum so the septum transversum is this part which was present more anteriorly and now it comes to lie below the heart so now you are able to see the heart tube and anteriorly what you see is the pericardial cavity the serous cavity which you are able to see here okay and below the septum transversum will be formed so originally this part was somewhere here and now the head fold has occurred and it has come to lie here now slowly this heart tube is going to form as i told you many expansions which i already told you the constrictions and the parts of the primitive heart tube that is the bulbous cord is primitive ventricle primitive atrium and the sinus venosus it has to enter into this cavity and so it also shows some foldings or looping of the heart tube which is called as the cardiac loop so due to the formation of the cardiac loop the most inferior part what you see here is the atrium will go backwards dorsally and also upwards superiorly okay so slowly you are able to see because of the bulging of the heart tube this serous cavity is getting reduced to a potential space so now the heart tube how it has folded and it is completely reduced into a thin space and it is organized into a parietal and visceral layer of serous pericardium parietal and visceral layer of the serous pericardium so this is in short about the development of the pericardium okay now one more view what we will see is so here you have the foregut posteriorly anteriorly you have the pericardial cavity and that is the fused heart tube this is actually called as the myoepicardial mantle this is actually called as the myoepicardial mantle which is going to form the musculature of the heart 
and not only that this also forms your visceral layer of serous pericardium so as the heart bulges into this pericardial cavity now you are able to see how the myo epicardial mantle and what happens is the serous pericardium how it surrounds the visceral layer of serous pericardium is actually derived from the myo epicardial mantle and both are derived from the splanchnopleuric layer of mesoderm whereas the parietal layer of serous pericardium will be developed from the somatopleuric layer of intraembryonic mesoderm okay so fibrous pericardium is from septum transversum which i have already mentioned parietal layer of serous pericardium is developed from the somatopleuric layer of intraembryonic mesoderm whereas the visceral layer of serous pericardium is developed from the myo epicardial mantle and that again is from the splanchnopleuric layer of intraembryonic mesoderm now coming to the blood supply and nerve supply fibrous pericardium is mainly blood supply is from the internal thoracic artery and the descending thoracic aorta systemic arteries whereas visceral is mainly supplied by the coronary arteries nerve supply again okay before that venous drainage it is by the azygos and internal thoracic vein so they are all systemic veins mostly supplying or draining the body wall so that the same modalities the fibrous pericardium as the same modalities as that of the body wall so visceral layer it is drained by the coronary sinus that is the venous channel which drains the blood from the heart okay fibrous pericardium and the parietal layer is supplied by the phrenic nerve the phrenic nerve which passes between the pericardium and the mediastinal pleura visceral layer is by sympathetic nerves that is by the plexus mainly the cardiac plexus and parasympathetic is by the vagus nerve visceral layer of serous pericardium this is in short about the blood supply and the nerve supply now we will come to the sinuses of pericardium so there are there is some space or a passage in between the layers of the pericardium they are called as the sinuses of pericardium there are two sinuses one is the transverse sinus and other one is the oblique sinus transverse sinus is a horizontal passage which is present between the outflow tract and the inflow tract outflow tract and the inflow tract horizontal passage and it is a intra serous layer it is present between the two layers of the visceral pericardium between the two layers of the visceral pericardium so in front we have the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk behind we have the superior vena cava and the left atrium upper margin of the left atrium so this passage is the transverse sinus of pericardium above you have the bifurcation of pulmonary trunk below you have the left atrium so here you are able to see the demonstration of the transverse sinus in front you have the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk behind you see the superior vena cava and behind that left atrium is not seen from your view okay so it is a transverse passage between the outflow and inflow tract and it is present between the two visceral layers it is an inter visceral space here you are able to see this is actually the fibrous pericardium which is actually cut and reflected so cut end of the fibrous pericardium here you are able to see here this is your arch of aorta and that is the branches of arch of aorta right brachiocephaly this is your left common carotid and that is your left subclavian 
and here you are able to see the nerves so arch of aorta relations anteriorly and to the left in the superior mediastinum class i have described about the four nerves phrenic nerve vagus nerve superior cervical cardiac branch inferior cervical cardiac branch and your recurrent left recurrent laryngeal nerve okay so that is the transverse sinus of pericardium for you now how actually the transverse sinus develops so the heart tube from behind it actually invaginates into the pericardial cavity posteriorly you have the dorsal mesocardium through which the heart tube is suspended now as the heart tube bulges into this cavity i told you it forms a loop bulbo ventricular loop because this bulbous cord is this is the primitive ventricle since the fold takes place at the bulbo ventricular space it is called as bulbo ventricular loop so once the complete looping takes place this dorsal mesocardium actually obliterates and disappears and thereby a space is created so this space between the outflow tract and the inflow tract is actually called as the transverse sinus of pericardium the next uh, you are able to see is the oblique sinus of pericardium now the oblique sinus of pericardium is actually behind the left atrium okay whereas the transverse sinus of pericardium is actually above and in front of the left atrium so actually the upper border of the left atrium is the only structure which is intervening between the transverse sinus and the oblique sinus now the oblique sinus is present between the parietal and the visceral layers whereas the transverse sinus is present in between the two reflections of the visceral layer so this is transverse sinus you are able to see this is one visceral layer this is one visceral layer in between the two visceral layers only the transverse sinus is present but whereas the oblique sinus is present between the visceral and the parietal layers of the serous pericardium now how actually this oblique sinus develops it is closed on all sides so that is why you call it as cul de sac above and on to the sides the only way where it is opened is below the sinus is actually opened below now how actually this space develops is superior vena cava pierces the fibrous pericardium to enter the heart inferior vena cava pierces then the right and left pair of their pulmonary veins also pierce everything has to pierce the fibrous pericardium and you know very well that if they pierce the fibrous pericardium what is intimately attached to the fibrous pericardium is the parietal layer so together they will pierce these two naturally they will raise a fold as they enter they will actually raise a fold between the parietal and the serous layer and thereby this space is actually created with all these six veins they enter by piercing the fibrous pericardium okay so in front it is related to the left atrium and behind it is related to the fibrous pericardium with the parietal layer lining the interior of the fibrous pericardium so right side you have the right pair of pulmonary veins spc and ivc left side you have the left pair of pulmonary veins all six veins when they enter they raise a fold so that is the place where the oblique sinus is being demonstrated so the fibrous pericardium you are able to see and the inner aspect of the fibrous pericardium is smooth and shining because what is lining the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium is the parietal layer of serous pericardium whereas the visceral layer will be intimately attached to the heart so between the visceral and the parietal layer you have the oblique sinus of pericardium so because you are able to see it is oblique in nature that is why you call it as oblique sinus that space is actually oblique and it is created because these 
six veins superior vena cava inferior vena cava the four pulmonary veins they raise a fold thereby between these six veins a space is created and that we call it as the oblique sinus it is actually a reservoir parietal space now what is the importance of the sinus especially the transverse sinus during cardiac surgery you can actually pass a ligature may be passed through this and naturally you can tie this you are able to understand to control hemorrhage especially during cardiac surgery the transverse sinus is used to pass a ligature and tie the outflow tract to control the hemorrhage next is inflammation of the pericardium is actually called as pericarditis especially the serous layer gets inflamed why it might get inflamed might be due to some infections which might have track down from the neck into the superior mediastinum and then from there to the middle mediastinum because the pretracheal layer is coming and merging up to the adventitial coat of these great vessels any infections from the neck can easily track down same way from the retropharyngeal space so from the retropharyngeal space that is also a dangerous space of the neck from there it might track down and it might spread to the pericardium so you might get pericarditis inflammation of the pericardium so accumulation of the pericardial fluid takes place when there is an accumulation of pericardial fluid first it will compress the atria first it will compress the atria because ventricles are thick walled whereas the atrium are actually thin walled so this fluid will exert a pressure over the atria first it will lead to filling defect because when the atria cannot contract properly it cannot empty the contents into the ventricle that is one thing second thing is because the atria is again compressed the veins opening into this atria also cannot pour in contents effectively so thereby it mainly leads to the filling defect now what is cardiac tamponade this is again because of accumulation of the pericardial fluid the pericardial fluid has to be continuously secreted at the same time it has to be renewed so around 300 ml of the fluid is present in the pericardial cavity so it compresses the heart so slow chronic accumulation what happens it will compress the heart then the heart cannot pump effectively so because of that there will be a decreased diastolic capacity okay so the heart will not able to fill because the heart cannot expand due to this accumulation of fluid what happens is there will be a decreased diastolic capacity because of it when it contracts again the ventricles there is going to be decreased cardiac output okay. but increased venous pressure and increased pulse pressure so the pulse and venous pressure is increased but there is a decreased diastolic capacity and decreased cardiac output in case of cardiac tamponade sometimes you hear a fractional rub in acute pericarditis okay in acute pericarditis the pericardial fluid might not be secreted and it might lead to a fractional rub when you hear the heart sounds so pericardiocentesis is aspiration of pericardial fluid so excess fluid has to be drained or you aspirate some amount of the pericardial fluid for some diagnostic purposes this can be done through two routes one is the subcostal route and other one is actually the parasternal route subcostal is actually done via the left costo xiphoid angle between the costal left to costal margin of the xiphoid process through the costo xiphoid angle it can be done the patient has to be mildly propped up so he has to actually not sit upright or it cannot completely lie down on a supine position in a slanting position slightly propped up 
then what happens at a angle of 45 degrees through the subcostal route you can approach the pericardium and perform pericardiosynthesis the other one is lateral to the sternum it is actually called as parasternal route and most preferred area is left to fourth to fifth intercostal space because the lung and the pleura deviates on the left side between the fourth to sixth costal cartilage so if you perform at this place we will not be puncturing the pleura or the lungs parasternal close to the lateral margin of the sternum okay so that is the parasternal route where actually the pericardiosynthesis can be performed so that is about the applied anatomy so in today's class we have discussed about the pericardium and the sinuses of pericardium in detail thank you very much for your patient listening